I don't know about you, but I've been getting a lot out of this series on the Sermon on the Mount. I, uh, I've read through it many times, but um, this time studying through it, I just have felt like God's really been working on me and working on my heart. And uh, it's been a good series for me. I hope it's, I hope it's been blessing y'all. Have you watched the news this week? I tried not to, but I do. Are you worried? Seems like we got a lot to worry about these days, right? The economy stinks. Uh, I hear inflation rates batted around that say from 8% uh, to currently 3.1%. But all I know is that most of the grocery items I buy are about 30 to 70% higher than they were two years ago. What about your health? How's your health doing? You worry about it? Every expert will tell you that what you're eating is killing you. It doesn't matter what you're eating. Every month we alternate between coffee being toxic to coffee being good for you. I'm voting for good for you. In fact, I have a prescription, best prescription I ever got. Uh, My gastroenterologist, um, I take a medicine that they have to watch. One of my organs, my liver, I think. And... um, and uh, I got to watch some, some something that's going on in there. So he said, okay, I want you to drink as much coffee as you can stand and take vitamin E. And I'm like, that's the best prescription I ever got. So I'm getting a medical bracelet that just says Starbucks right here. And that way, <laughs> they can lay me out and give it to me. It goes on and on and on, though, right? We can find stuff to worry about all over the place. In his book... Jesus' spiritual journey in ours, Thomas Kepler tells about a woman that realized that her worry was, was running and ruining her life. And so she made herself a worry table, not like a, a table, but like a chart. And she tabulated all her anxieties. And so after a period of time, she discovered that her worries could be characterized as follows. 40% were things that would never happen. 30% were things that had already happened and she couldn't change. were other people's criticisms of her, most of them untrue. 10% were needless fears about her health, which actually made her more unhealthy. Only 8% were actual problems that she could do something about. So 92% of the stuff that she was worried about, she couldn't do a, a thing about. That's pretty consistent with other studies that have been done. Worrying never affects the final outcome of a situation. I heard a baseball player, I think he is... It was Willie Amos, who I think used to play for the Rangers. I can't remember. But it was a game. He's getting up to bat. You know, they tell the little stories. And he was known for just being cool as a cucumber. And so they'd ask him why that was. And his, this is what his response was. It's oddly biblical. Ain't no use worrying about the things you ain't got control over. Because since you ain't got control over them, ain't no use worrying about them. Ain't no use worrying about the things you got control over. Because since you got control over them, ain't no use worrying about them. I thought, well, that's pretty practical. There was a French philosopher about 500 years ago named Michel de Montaigne, and he said, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. (laughs) Jesus, as he was teaching his disciples, had this to say about worry. And it's in its place in the lives of his follower. We're in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life, And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. One of the things that Jesus is telling us here is that worry focuses on the wrong things. He had just told his disciples that they could not serve God and possessions. Remember last week, they couldn't serve God and mammon, that stuff. To do so was to have your focus messed up, which would mess up your life. So he says, because of that, don't worry about obtaining things. Don't worry about getting stuff. And in this portion of his sermon, he's going to tell them not to worry, which is one of the results of serving things that are not God. He's going to use the word worry six times in this passage, and three times he's going to tell them not to worry. Do not worry. That word for worry means to strangle or to choke or to seize by the throat. The Greek definition refers to being drawn in different directions so as to be distracted. Worry will pull us apart, and it can lead to mental and emotional strangulation. It was used to refer to the practice of wolves killing sheep because they would bite them around the neck and then they would strangle their prey to death. That's what worry does to us. When Jesus tells his followers not to worry or to be anxious, he's not giving us a suggestion. Well, I think it would be best if you didn't worry. He's giving us a command. And if you look at the verb tenses used here, that command is all-inclusive. Basically, Jesus is saying, quit worrying if you're already doing it. Don't worry now, and don't start worrying about the future if you're not. Those who were listening to Jesus may have thought they were in the clear because his audience didn't contain a whole lot of rich people. They would not have had a great accumulation of money and possessions, so maybe they thought that Jesus was nailing the Pharisees and the wealthy. Remember last week, you know, you can't worship money and all this, and they're like, well, I got no money, I can't worship money, right? So I'm good. And then this part points right to them. This is directed at those that think they don't have or don't have enough for tomorrow. You don't have to be rich to be controlled by the pursuit of things. So why should we not worry? First reason, Jesus says, is that people are more important to God than any other created being. Genesis 1.26 And 27, tell us why. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And a few verses later, God looks at it, and he says it was very good. We are more valuable in God's eyes because we are the only creatures made in his image. You have value to God. God loves you and he knows what is best for you. And if you don't genuinely believe that he loves you and wants the best for you, you're going to keep worrying. Even if you try to do things that will help you not to worry. You can go to a counselor. They can give you some suggestions. Here's how to not worry. But if you don't believe that God loves you and wants the best for you, you're going to find a way to worry. And Jesus is arguing from the lesser to the greater. That's a common rabbinic teaching method. So he talks about how God feels about the birds of the air and how he clothes how, not how he feels, how he feeds the birds of the air, and how he, he clothes the fields because they're part of creation and he cares for them. But God loves us and cares for us to a much greater extent. So if he provides for the needs of the birds in the fields, we can be confident that he's going to provide for our needs. Not only that, God knows far better than we do what we need. Because he's all-knowing, he's all-seeing, he's all-powerful. He knows exactly what is best for you, and he has the power and the authority to make sure that that is what we receive. And the worry that some people have over the material things in life is rooted in a low understanding, I think, of their value to God. 
I got to tell you, my idea of what, sometimes this is our trouble, is our idea of what need is. You know, I've looked in my closet before and go, I need a new pair of shoes. And there's several pair in there. Oh, I need a new pair. I need a brown pair that'll go with this, this suit or this, like I have worn a suit in I don't know how long. Hypothetically speaking, you know, <clears throat> when I was on the road and we were doing stories, we were in Douglas, Arizona, and we crossed over into um, Agua Prieta. And the guy we were doing a story on was going to one of the Mexican prisons there, but we had to drive through, uh, you would call it a part of town because people lived there. But the houses were made of a few cinder blocks, some corrugated steel, cardboard boxes. I had never seen anything like it. And we went to their church, which they were very proud of, and it was a cinder block church. It was a rectangle, had a door, two windows, no roof, no doors, nothing in the windows, and that was it, and they were glad to have it. And they came to church barefoot because they didn't have shoes. And all of a sudden, me looking in my closet and going, well, I need another pair of shoes, sounded kind of hollow. Because there are plenty of people that didn't have shoes. And so one of the things God did for me was change what I thought was a need. And sometimes my choice of lifestyle constitutes what I think of as a need. And... Uh, you know, I think of that sometimes. We're helping Pastor Mawali out uh, in Africa. And if you look around, I got to tell you, we're a rich church. And by, by the world's standards, this is a wealthy, wealthy church. And uh, it just makes me think. You know, when it comes time for us to help and do different things, that's not trying to manipulate. But I've just become very aware this year of how God has blessed us and how much we have. And as a family, even Amy and I, just how God's blessed us. And uh, we might look at things and go like, well, I wish we had one of these. You know what? There's so many people in the world who are like, I wish I had a meal today. And uh, boy, it changes your perspective. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's a word of caution here, too, I think. When we consider, Jesus says, consider the birds. So he's like, look at them and think about it. They're busy, right? And it's not like when they were in the nest and they're sitting there and they just uh, got their mouth open, waiting for their mom to come drop food in. They don't do that their whole life. They're out looking for food. They're busy. They're flying around. They got no refrigerators. They're not going to store it for days or anything. But every day they're out looking for it. So Jesus is not saying you should just be lazy and wait for God to drop it all in your lap. There's not any manna coming tomorrow. Although God provides the food, they still have to search for it and they gather it. And then the implication here is that God's children are to engage in sowing and reaping and gathering. In other words, if we're able, some are not able, but if we're able, we're to work for our food and not just sit around and wait for God to drop it in our kitchen. Thomas Edison said this, I kind of like the way he put this, is a cure for worry, work is better than whiskey. Like, don't turn to the bottle to deal with your worry, just go work. That'll help. People are more important to God than any other created being. Worry does not add to your life, Jesus says in verse 27. It doesn't make you taller either. Josh. <clears throat> <laughs> Who I heard today was six, two and a half. The word, the, the passage in the Greek literally says it can't add a single cubit to your height, but Jesus is clearly not talking about height. There was an expression used like worrying just doesn't add that stuff to your life. You can't make your life longer. You can't make yourself higher. Worry is not going to help there. Worry is like a rocking chair. There's a lot of energy involved, but it doesn't get you anywhere. It won't change a thing except you, and it's going to make you miserable. Stress is one of the greatest contributors to disease and poor health. 
So if you're worried about your health, stop worrying about your health because you're killing your health. Worry is a sign of lack of faith. Jesus literally calls the disciples little faith ones here. Now that can be a confrontational term and there's some other places he uses it. It sounds kind of like a rebuke. And I think there's a, there's a tone to that here, but it can also be an endearing term. And in this context, Jesus' tone is not really scolding, but it's more coaxing and reasoning. He's really asking, he says, do you trust the Father or not? Not with a slap in our face, but kind of an arm around our shoulder. He's, so he's not belittling his disciples, but he's encouraging them upward. It's a mild rebuke. Hebrews eleven six says this, And it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So let's be honest. Worry is a sin. And I think, in all honesty, it's become an acceptable sin to us. I'm not sure we really understand how damaging worry, worry is. Because when we worry, we're essentially saying to God, I don't trust you. Worry is the sin of not trusting the promises and the providence of God. Worry will dull your heart and it'll pull you away from God. Jesus warned a group of people who were worrying about some scary things he said were going to happen in the future. In Luke 21, 34, he says, Watch out, don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. And when he explained the parable of the seed and the sower, and he was talking about the seed that fell among the thorns, he said that represents those who let worry overwhelm them. Matthew 13, 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. Why is that? It's the same thing Jesus has been talking about all through the Sermon on the Mount. Worry draws your focus off of God and places it onto yourself. And so when we worry, we're living without faith. And so Jesus says we're acting like those who have no God. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Pagans or Gentiles is really what he's referring to here. They worship false gods. Their gods were all too human-like and were not counted on to provide because they could be so capricious. They never knew what mood their gods were going to be in, so they were always trying to find ways to manipulate the gods to do this. And so they lived with this anxiety, never knowing if they had convinced their gods to help them out or not. And their worship involved sensual pleasures and drunkenness, and so these people were living for their pleasures, and they were dedicating themselves to seeking those, running after them, pursuing them. They were diligently seeking and craved satisfaction in things that would leave them empty. And Jesus was saying, don't act like people who don't believe in God. Though it should never be the case for the followers of Jesus, the sad fact is that our lives are too often characterized by the same worry that's evident in the non-believing world. Worry affects our witness. Isn't our gospel a message of trusting in Jesus? Isn't that what we're saying? You should trust Jesus. You should trust Jesus for your salvation. Are we saying you can trust Jesus for your salvation, but not for everyday living? What kind of a weak God do we think we serve? One writer said, worry is practical atheism. We're acting like there is no God. So what does that mean for me? This is the portion of the sermon where I usually give you two or three ideas 
of how you can apply the sermon. You're always free to come up with your own, allow the Holy Spirit to teach. You don't have to do what I say. But this time, Jesus tells us what to do. Jesus says, here's what this means for you. He gives us the antidote to where he says, seek his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is simply the sphere in which God's will is done. It is the life that is lived under his rule in which his purposes, his plans, and his ways prevail. It's the realm based on the foundational principle that God owns everything and we merely manage the resources he's entrusted us on his behalf. And so when we learn to live with that basic premise, we find that we really don't have a lot to worry about, right? Our focus shifts from trying to protect what I have for my benefit to doing all I can to be faithful with what God has entrusted me and trusting the results to him. And the irony is that when we do that, God's promised to meet our needs. What Jesus is saying here is that there are two approaches to meeting my needs. One, I can choose to focus on meeting my needs on my own, which is only going to lead to worry. Or I can focus on being a good steward and being faithful to God, and he'll take care of my needs and leave me free of worry. We were talking today, God didn't always meet our needs when we think he should meet our needs. Lord, I have this need. I'd like you to meet it tomorrow. When I wake up in the morning, I want the check in the mail. I want it in my box. And God says, I'll take care of your need on my time. We don't like that. But as we were talking in Sunday school, I thought, you know, that gap is where we learn stuff, right? Lord, I have a need. I need you to take care of it. And I wait, and I wait, and sometimes I really wait. And in that time, I'm learning something about faith. Do I really believe that God's going to take care of that need? Maybe God's already told me ways that I can do some things to help meet that need. Maybe not. Am I going to be obedient? But that time between when I tell him what I need and when he acts and sends me what I need, there's a lot of growth happening. Remember, Jesus already said God knows exactly what you need. He also knows when you need it. Jesus said, seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness. Jesus is speaking to his followers in this passage, so he's not telling them to seek the righteousness that's given to us through Christ at the moment of salvation. He's not talking about when, when Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. The idea here is that we would place the highest priority on developing a lifestyle that's characterized by the very things he talked about at the beginning of his, of his sermon, being poor in spirit mourning over our sin, hungering and thirsting to live like Christ, being merciful, being pure in heart, and being peacemakers. Or as the humorous Will Rogers put it, we ought to live in such a way that we would not be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> if you'll allow me to make kind of a bold statement, I think many of us are as close to God as we want to be. We don't really want to get that much closer. We're kind of comfortable right where we're at. And some of us are stressed out because we want to be worried. It's what we do. We like to worry. It gives us something to talk about. And the reason that we have so many worries is because we are seeking everything but God first. And the promise Jesus makes is that if we seek him first, then all these things will be given. Sometimes the way it's given is the same way he gave me shoes in Mexico, is realizing, I don't need another pair of shoes. You're right, Lord. And then Jesus says, place your future in God's hands. I can imagine Jesus saying this part with a smile on his face. Don't borrow trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough trouble. Today has got enough trouble of its own. We get frozen over what might happen next week or next month or next year, and, and troubles today have enough to keep you busy, right? But we have this great promise from God. We sang it in Him. 
Lamentations 3.23, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. God does not run out of mercy. God does not run out of faithfulness. What he gives you today is still there to give tomorrow. They're new every day. Lord, thank you for getting me through today. And in the morning, Lord, please get me through today. And Jesus is saying, don't look for things to worry about. Remember, most of the things we worry about never happen. And that's not curative. It's not like they didn't happen because you worried about them. It's just they don't happen. Jesus' command not to worry about tomorrow goes hand in hand with how he taught us to pray, remember? Give us this day our daily bread. And the idea here is to live one day at a time. Now, I'm not sure Charlie Brown quite understood the principle, but he was on the right track when he said, I've developed a new philosophy. I only dread one day at a time. The Apostle Paul gave us this advice. Philippians 4, 6-7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He's done, and then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is this. We give up our worry to Jesus And he gives us his peace in return. And the distinction between genuine concern about something which can be healthy, it's okay to plan for tomorrow. It's okay to to save and do all those things. In fact, Scripture tells us in plenty of places how wise that is. But that's different than worry, which is not healthy. The difference is whether we can take that concern to Jesus and release it in prayer or whether we continue to hang on to it after we've prayed. Jesus gives us peace in exchange for worry when we focus on his kingdom rather than on the things of the world. Listen, Jesus loves you more than you can understand. He loves you so much that he willingly left the glory of heaven to come here to earth, born as a baby in a stable, living a life where he was ridiculed, persecuted, ultimately dying the most horrible death on the cross, He did that so that he could offer you forgiveness for your sin, rose again from the dead so that he could offer you eternal life. No one has ever loved you like that except Jesus. And all he asks is that you quit trusting in your own good works and you trust him for what he's done. Now, if you're here today, and that's something you want to do, or if you're just considering it and you want to know more about it, would you allow us the privilege of helping you take that step? Talk with me after the service. Make an appointment. We'll get together. You can have that conversation with Jesus as we sing. For those of you that already have a personal relationship with Jesus, my guess is that you still struggle with worry. We wouldn't be human if we didn't. I know I do. And if that's the case, the next time you're tempted to worry, would you just go to Jesus and give those worries to him? He'll trade you. Your worries for his peace. Let's pray.